So you came on uh, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, or when did you, when did you come? You came on Sunday, oh, Saturday? Friday. Friday. Uh, welcome to the DMM uh, Working Group. My name is uh, Shri Gundavalli. Satoru Matsushima. Uh, today's uh, agenda, I think, before we get into that, some the, I, be, please be aware of the IETF's IPR policy. I'll give you a few seconds to read the content in the slide. <laughs> Okay, there's a note well statement. Again, please be aware of the IETF's policies with respect to your code of conduct or patterns or other things. Please uh, be aware of all the publications. We need a note taker, any volunteer, Thank you, John. John is going to uh, take notes. Thanks, appreciate it. Uh, this is the update since the last meeting in Yokohama. The segment routing IPv6 for mobile user plane document is uh, the work is complete. Uh, ESG has approved it and prior to that and uh, subsequently the document was published as RFC 9433. Congratulations to the authors, to the working group. A lot of efforts went into this. I realized that POCs and many things, very good work, excellent. Uh, lots of good discussions, debates, you know, I think that's all part of the game, but good stuff. The next one is uh, on the working group document is the mobile over transport uh, network slicing document. Uh, John is going to give an update. He did, uh, John and the authors did an update on the document. Uh, they, they revised the document and I think uh, we need to uh, bring it, uh, bring a closure to that work. That's one thing, but uh, we'll, we'll hear more on the update. Now, I think a uh, few things. Uh, I just want to talk about things that we are tracking. If you look at our uh, the overall the working group charter, there are a few items that we haven't completed. Uh, one is with respect to some indications from the network about offload and other things. I think we need to uh, complete that work and we are discussing it already on the approaches. That's one thing. And uh, this is the agenda for today. We'll start with the working group document. Uh, John, you're going to give the update today. Okay. And uh, these are the rest of the topics and uh, that's all. And I'll uh, share John's slides.
John? Okay, thank you. Um, so this is the mobility aware transport networking slice for slicing for 5G draft. It's version seven. Um, it's as um, Sri mentioned, it, this is has been a working group draft and um, has been commented on a lot already. Um, so now it's ready. I mean, there were some substantial comments in the last meeting that uh, the authors have looked at. So if we go to the next page, I'll try to outline what the changes are. Okay, right. So the updates from the previous version to what it is now is addressing the three broad comments that came up. Even though there were only three, one or two of them required some significant changes and I'll go over each of them um, as I walk through the slides. So first, um, you know, let me just say what each of those are. The first one is, was about mobility aware and what does that mean in the context of this slide? Uh, I'm sorry, not the slide, but the draft. Um, and uh, you know, this draft has been in progress for some time. It, it preceded the work in T's and um, a lot of the progress in 3GPP too. So it's been around for a few years. So um, the notions have changed. There's work in T's that identifies how the slices are handled. There's been progress in 3GPP in the management section on 28.xxx slides. Uh, so all of that, um, you know, given, I think I've taken the action to remove the mobility aware from everywhere except the title. Um, and I've made the clarification to say the slice mapping proposed here is supported transparently when a 5G user device moves across 5G attachment points and session anchors. So this is only to say that the mechanism of mapping that's proposed in this draft does not, in other words, cause any other problems in the 3GPP mechanisms. It's fully transparent to it. So that's where it is at and I think as a group, you know, maybe we need to have some thoughts about do we need to change the title? Is that okay? Or, I mean, I can think of titles and maybe propose it on the list, uh, but that's something we should think about. Will it confuse readers later on? You know? So, um, because a method that's proposed in this draft is something like um, a UDP source port based mapping for 5G slices. So that's, you know, so we could think um, you know, if people have strong opinions about that, we can think about changing the title. Um, but anyway, that's where this is at um, in terms of addressing, you know, so if you have any thoughts on that, happy to take that. Then the next- So, so John, one question, okay. right? When you say change, change it to what actually? Can you put, um, put some more thoughts actually? I okay. think uh, so, I'm not fully getting the, yeah. Okay, maybe I went too quickly on that. So yeah. one thought that I would, think about is a UDP based, a UDP source port based mapping uh, from 5G to um, transport slicing, transport slices. Uh, I can refine the words, but that's the, the general thought. Yes. Okay. So that would clearly say what's in the draft. Uh, this is so, more- so, so you want to be more specific on it on, on, rather than being more broader with respect to- Yes, yes. But maybe I can put that on the list. I mean, even I, think, I haven't thought fully about yeah, this. Yeah, so. I think we need more discussion on that, particularly. I think some of the comments that uh, you're seeing here, right? I think well before T's working group has started on working on slicing. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter when they started or when, if they started late or early, but the thing in thing is we need to make sure there's alignment, right? I think that's my key, co that's uh, the comment, right? So yes. yeah, that's a feedback. Um, to answer Sri's point, I think, we have now fully aligned and I'll cover it up in the, in the okay. next two bullets. Uh, now on, this, on the, the title itself, maybe do you think it's an okay idea to start a thread on yeah. that and Please. ask the group 
you know, make a couple of proposals. Maybe others have ideas and see where, where there's answer. I'll do that right after the, you know, this week or maybe early next week. Um, okay. Next slide. All right. No, no, still, yeah, I, I okay. want to just sure. go through the next yeah, yeah, two yeah. points, yeah. Uh, if I may. Um, so the, the general cleanup and revision, you know, so this was, again, related to a whole bunch of changes we need to make um, because there were, there were readability parts and also duplication that we removed to make sure that it is both aligned with the T's work and also not duplicating anything from 3GPP per se. We are only referring to it with, um, you know, just context to provide readability that you could go go to the 28. or 25. xx slide uh, drafts or, or standards in 3GPP. Okay. So that those are the three broad changes, and I'll go through each of them. So maybe I won't spend too much time here, but um, uh, so from the old, you can see what's marked in red on the left side. There was a number of chapter two sections that's now been reorganized into a chapter three, a simpler topology, um, uh, chapter topology, and only covering the 5G end-to-end -end slicing, the front hall and mid hall, back hall, and the mechanism to use it. A simple set of uh, things. It covers everything that the working group has commented on. And uh, so, you know, I have not removed anything, but I've, uh, in terms of the comments that we received over the various versions. So I think it's consistent with what the working group has asked us to do. Uh, but I've removed what also the working group has asked me to do in terms of um, terminology and concepts that are there in T's and other working groups. Okay. okay. So that's in the next slide. Okay, so here the changes are simple. Um, it's uh, fairly basic to say, uh, simple but important, I think, because one of the uh, changes that was asked was um, to not have much 5G terminology. So essentially, we've kept that 5G management plane and referred to functions there and not create another name like TNO. Um, so that's the main change. Um, not, it doesn't affect the draft significantly, but it's cleaning it up to say it's referring to 5G standards. And so everything that's in the figure, I don't want to walk through the whole, um, you know, what this is about, because I think we've done it several times. But very briefly, I'll say that it's a question about mapping from what's in the 5G, how 5G manages slices to um, how that's associated to the, the IP network transport slice. Okay, and then here the change is only about the mapping to 5G. Okay. Uh, the next slide. Yeah, here is a significant change from, since we removed all the description that was, um, you know, in terms of the, the concepts that were introduced, MTNC and other things, now we're simply referring to 5G. And the, the slice hierarchy and the slice details over there, it's, it, this, is, this is just uh, very similar to what's in the 28.xxx documents and adapted to show the IP slice. So the hierarchy here, and I'll, I'll spend a little time to go through what it is. You have communication services for 5G that are associated to uh, one or more slices uh, you know, that's identified by an NSS AI. So for example, communication service B may be served by a network slice B, which is identified uh, or a network slice A. And each of those network slices uh, operate, um, I mean, are in these virtual NSSIs, the network slice subnets that consist of core um, and uh, radio aspects, and there is an interconnection between them, which is the IP slice that we are expanding on here, the transport part. And the question is, how is that mapped between what, 3G, what a 3GPP endpoint, like an EP transport, is mapped to uh, 5G uh, and carried over to the IP network that, such that uh, the IP network can map it to the corresponding 
um, service requirements in the 5G network. If, if I, I hope that's, that, that's a lot, I think, in there. Um, if anybody has questions, I can take it now or later to explain the hierarchy. Uh, but the point we we'll have to look at here is on the IP slice part and the mapping between uh, that IP slice and the service slice in the 5G network. So I'll go to the next page. Okay. And here is a subset that shows how that mapping works um, from in one instance. I mean, so you have an upstream GTPU packet that's going from a GNOME BCU to the UPF. And that crosses an attachment circuit, which is a data center network, and goes to an IP backhaul, which is the IP slice provider, and then finally reaches a customer network, which hosts the UPF. So in this case, the configuration and the mappings are shown below. So basically, the 3GPP configuration is to say that the service and the network slice is now, for example, in this case, 000B which is mapped to a network slice subset AN2, because that's the, uh, the 3GPP access network slice. And that, those slice mapping, again, going into detail, would, you know, it would go to the end transport, which says the SNSSAI is 000B. The logic interface type is a new one. That's, that is what we're proposing in this draft, which is a UDP source port. And uh, the interface ID, the source port ID is 5678 in this, in, in this example. And the IP address to the destination is the UPF core network uh, IP address, the UPF CN1 IF. So when, when the packet, the GTP packet is sent out, it will use this mapping to use a source port address of 5678 no mapping occurs in the data center network because there is no uh, slice per se. So that is the attachment circuit problem that we are solving here. It crosses over to the PE and the PE has a slice map. It's a source EPC, a match on source code IP address of coming from GMP and AM2, with a source code address 5678. And the action This occurs in a one way traffic upstream. Similarly, there are configurations downstream of the other one. So, this is a one way mapping. So one question, John, is the logic interface type, was that previously there or you guys just started, added the type? So the logic interface was, um, if you go to the last slide, I may be able to, I'm just okay. really trying to answer it without. Okay. Uh, the very last, I mean, I put it in the back of it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So just to put it in context, uh, the logic interface ID is part of the GP transport object in mm -hmm. And it already has and TLS and second transport. So, what we're proposing here is a new type, and uh, you know, so that's what we're at. Okay. So that's. A question from. Yeah. Oh, uh, actually, my comment is not about this particular uh, slide. It's. It towards the, the end. Okay. Yeah, I, I think these are the changes we have made. Uh, and now we've aligned it fully with Keith's terminology. In fact, the Keith work has got several methods to match 
this is one of the methods of one of the many methods you know so it, it aligns fully in terms of terminology and concept uh, and it addresses the, the, the common problem Um, so I'm sure that so this document is now fully aligned with the concept and terminologies in the TS, but then there is an, another uh, draft in the TS specifically talks about the 5G network slicing IPMPOS network. Um, I think it, that document covers some methods and things like that. So there may be some content uh, um, in the both drafts that cover the same thing. I think uh, it, it, it will be good to uh, to review the content of both uh, uh, draft and see if they cover the same thing and what, what we should do about it. In fact, uh, I'm putting Luis on the spot here. He is the co-author of that draft and maybe. <laughs> One question, John, uh, there was a feedback that you should speak into the mic. Yeah. yeah. Can you maybe raise the mic like slightly? Yeah. Okay, maybe. Let's see. Hmm. Shoot. Oh. For the time being, we'll use, uh, okay. okay. I'll pass the mic around when um, Hanu says we can't hear us either. Hanu, can you hear us? I thought this is working. We, we, we can, I can hear. The you okay. And okay. Only okay. Thanks. Out of order. John. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. I mean, maybe I'll comment quickly on um, Jeffrey's uh, comment and uh, then let Lewis. I've been working with the authors in the other draft to align, and this is one method in among many in that draft. So, with respect to the method in this draft, that's outlined there and described here. Okay, next, next in the queue, Richard. Sorry, Richard. Or... Thank you, Richard. Okay, let me start. So, um, in many multimedia applications, we have two UDP ports. So when you use UDP port to match to a slice, which one are you going to use? No, no you, you, two source ports, like the, which one are you going to use? Um, so um, this method is totally transparent to the traffic that goes in the multimedia or whatever other stream that's there. Uh, this is simply observing what is in the 5G network in terms of what infrastructure it provides to the application. So the application may use multiple or single, but the UDP port that we're talking about is for the GTP, so the so, underlay. So the outside uh, UDP port, source port, right? Not the inner source port of the, of the application. So uh, I would say that just to clarify between the inner and the outer is that you may have, let's say, um, application one on UDP port one and yeah. an application two on UDP port no, two, no. but this is a GTP UDP port. No, okay, you have application one, right. UDP port, source port one, uh, right. S1, right. then you have GDP, you ha then you have outside UDP port. So are you going to use outside UDP port or the application UDP port? The, the tunnel, the outside. The tunnel, yes. okay, so you, this might mean uh, may have some issues because different applications may have different QS requirements, but they may share the same 
an UDP port because they are both encapsulated inside the GDP tunnels. So we do not right. address that problem. That's something that uh, 3GPP should do because uh, there is a class of... So um, to answer Richard's question, um, if the service requires different um, UDP ports or other classification, 3GPP will set up different PDP, uh, PDU connections and then the PDU connections are mapped to the appropriate uh, underlays. So maybe uh, John, uh, let's take this offline. I think. Uh, yeah, I can like take this offline. Question. We are slightly running out of time. I think okay, I'll take it offline then. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, John? Uh, we'll. we'll uh, 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 PNG is there, but I think we may have to. Okay, just very quick. Uh, yeah. Here, uh, you're talking about end-to-end -end, uh, now slicing and talk about the, the GTP part. I did not see your mention about N9. Are you, if you have both N3 and N9, are you going to get the same slice? No, um, it depends on, it's for every, trans I mean, you're talking about the IP slice, right? Right, right. The things like uh, suppose you have uh, like uh, anchor UPF and uh, non anchor UPF, so you have N9 and you have N3 on the end to end. So, are you going to get the same slice at then? So the GTP, uh, so the 5G slice is going to be the same. It's mapped by the NSS AI and into the subnet, but the mapping into the IP transport slice depends on the IP transport network. Thank you. And uh, I would like to request for some reviews uh, from the from members of the group who follow this. And uh... yeah. so uh, I think uh, we are slightly running out of time. I think we have to move to the next presentation. Yeah. Sorry, we, the queue is closed. OK, I just have a very short comment um, here. The, um, we have a draft in RTG um, WG is talking about how to a mapping whatever in the GTP tunnel into the IP network to the destination, to the data center. Just oh, let people thank know. Thank you. Thank you, John. We'll go to the next presentation. Jeffrey. Yeah. yeah. PNG? Okay. Oh, sorry. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Good uh, afternoon. So uh, this is uh, the draft, the, the six uh, iterations uh, regarding a integration of uh, the AN, the access network node, and the UPF is uh, the user pin function in the 5GS. So it's uh, uh, the co-author work uh, with uh, um, quite a few people here. Uh, next one. And yes, uh, this uh, slide just gives you the basic idea. Uh, this one, the, the same thing has been uh, presented quite a few times. I think, I think this is the fourth uh, presentation since last July. So the, the fundamental idea is to say, okay, well, for the, the 5G, when the UPF are more and more distributed close to GNOB uh, uh, access uh, network site. Oh, no, not yet. Sorry. And then, so what uh, can we do? Uh, can we do something uh, in order to handle this type of uh, situation? And also for the beyond 5G and the like uh, release 19 and the 6G, that is uh, after the end of next year, what, um, what we can do if the AN and the UPF integrate together as a single, um, we can call network function or some uh, network entity, uh, in this job, we call the uh, a noob. So you can just uh, this is a basic idea. A noob like uh, you can consider like a router or switching uh, device that going to integrate the functionality of the wireless and the wireline. And then and then for this one, it's going to handle both the three GPP wireless technologies and IET, IETF wireline technologies. So this is like uh, uh, the basic idea of the the draft. Okay, go to the next one. The the Next, the picture is just going to show you, okay, well, uh, for the first the two uh, pictures, it's, it's about the original one. And then the next the two uh, on the bottom part is like uh, if we uh, put the, the, the a, uh, access and uh, uh, UPF together, if we uh, call the a noob, what's going to happen? Okay, uh, the, uh, next. Yeah, can you go uh, uh, next? 
Yeah. Well, the this claim is like okay, but the work, the final, the standardized work, well, standardization itself will be done in three BP uh, for sure. But here we are, we are going to here we are uh, trying to get uh, some uh, socialization among the people because this one is going to involve the uh, IETF wireline technologies for sure, and also the uh, the three GPP uh, wireless work. And also, uh, I'm going to mention about uh, at the end, like 3GB release 19 is being planned right now. And uh, we are going, actually, you know, uh, I'm planning to do something with my uh, colleagues and with uh, partners to bring the similar ideas uh, for, for release 19 uh, planning and for 6G uh, planning. Yeah. This is a disclaimer. Uh, next slide and is just... I, I, I do want to comment as a chair on sure. this, right? Uh, what do we want from the DMM working group? That question stays because uh, there's a... Oh, yeah. Well, uh, at the end, okay. I'm going to ask okay. here, just try to give a disclaimer, say, okay, we acknowledge the work, the standard uh, for that part will be done. But here, you know, there are some work will be going to be involved from IETF side. Uh, here, it's just to give... It's an uh, uh, update uh, from uh, 116 uh, last time, uh, Yokohama to uh, 117. In uh, IETF uh, 116, uh, we did a presentation uh, on some work, like uh, the, the 3GP a noob like work in, uh, in 4G called the local IP access. And also, uh, it's some uh, high profile use cases, uh, like the 3GP satellite access. Uh, we did the presentation, but without the uh, revising the draft. So this time we revising the uh, we revised the draft, and then from zero six, and then uh, go through uh, zero from zero four to zero six, and zero five is um, there are some uh, other modifications. So basically from zero four to zero six. Yeah, next one. And then uh, here is the, just the, to, uh, the thing uh, we present in uh, Yokohama, but here uh, we put this one into um, the draft. So it's like a noob like So it's basically a noob is a, is a, is a novel idea, but the similar things has been uh, standardized in, in 4G already. It's like uh, the, called LIPA, local IP access. It's uh, using uh, a HE node B and uh, to integrate it with a local gateway. So there's no uh, as, uh, as, uh, uh, the, the red font, it's like uh, a noob like integration. There's no interface between uh, uh, HE node B, home uh, e, get, uh, e node B and the local gateway. So it's just like uh, the a noob like work. So the, the, this one we just to show, okay, well, this thing has been uh, discussed and standardized in 3 gp already. And, and next one. Yeah, this is uh, some high profile uh, uh, use cases for the satellite access and then the UE or ground station is on the ground and the mobile access and the core network is on board satellite. So for the, the thing between the UE and the GS and the uh, Gino B uh, and uh, Inu, it has it's going to be uh, deployed on board satellite. Okay. Uh, the next mm -hmm. thing. Uh, this one is just uh, to show a uh, different uh, projects that's been uh, done already uh, on the 3GPP for cell access and something being planned. So, uh, so basically, for the uh, the things like uh, it, you just consider, suppose you have the UE and the GS ground station uh, on the ground, and you have uh, uh, a noob or G node B or UPF on satellite, and then. You know, it's going to give you some challenge uh, if, uh, you know, um, you have everything uh, distributed, you have Genobi on one satellite and the UPF on the ground or on another satellite. So all kind of uh, uh, challenge or complex, or complexity, uh, complex control uh, among all the, uh, all the uh, entities and components. So this is the high profile use cases. Okay, uh, next. So, so far, well, here is the, like a, the, the summary of basically like what we want to do uh, in IETF. You know, from uh, IETF 114, 115, 116, and 117 until now, we have uh, presented quite a few times and cover like uh, the routing case, cover the uh, mobility handover, cover the net, cover the signaling, and even the, the microservice architecture that can be uh, friendly for the implementation part. And also we uh, to show some existing the work. That means that the same nursing has been standardizing 4G uh, already. And also discuss some use case, high profile use cases, like, like in the satellite. 
that has uh, some of them uh, have been accomplished and some of them are being uh, planned. So look at everything uh, uh, here from uh, 114 until today, we have uh, covered all kinds of uh, uh, aspects regarding the A loop like work. So I can go to the next. This is the other summary. Uh, one, just one, yeah. So here, the first is like a still, I want to continue discuss and after draft. And then, yeah. And then here is like, uh, as we, not, uh, we know now, is uh, the three GPP and IETF are so close to together. Uh, there are so many uh, new features, new requirements from three GPP and for new technologies. Uh, and that will be standardized, but uh, during the process, uh, it does. They they do need uh, uh, collaboration. They do need more uh, IETF new technology technology to help. Here, a summarize for four G, we have LIPA work that being standardized. It's like uh, the A new plug already. Uh, this one uh, so far, um, there are some providers, the mobile providers. Uh, having deployed, no, it's not yet uh, widely because uh, this is because uh, uh, now it's in the 5G world. 5G is talking about a disaggregated uh, infrastructure. So uh, in that in that case, uh, this one, uh, the like integration itself might not be uh, popular for the 5G. But the thing is the 5G now is like a, a lot of uh, um, a high profile uh, use cases like in the satellite cases. So for the 5G, it's talking about like the service based architecture for 5G core with the, normally with the consideration like the infrastructure itself is fixed, not much uh, uh, movement. But if you, if it continue to work like toward beyond 5G or 6G, and when the uh, infrastructure start to uh, move around, like if we deploy the core network on the, the satellite, those type of things, and then it's going to introduce another uh, dimension of complexity. So you have uh, like infrastructure complexity and you have the uh, core network things. So when you consider the thing together, 4G, 5G, and then 6G, and also look at the perfect timing, um, like uh, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the 6G planning, it will, it will be starting beginning of 25. So only like, uh, including this month, only a, uh, 18 months away from uh, today. So look at all the things, look at all the work right now. So uh, we, we want to go to the next one. The next one is like uh, uh, the team. We want to get uh, adoption for all the work we have done. And then we want to, you know, to say, okay, this is a perfect timing. When this one uh, is going to be, well, I'm not saying it's going to be finished, but uh, when it's going to mature by the, by the time, like the uh, next end of next year, or beginning of 25, and perfect time uh, for the uh, 6G roadmap and planning. So yeah, uh, welcome for any comments then. Yeah, any questions, comments? Jeffrey from Juniper. Um, just some clarification on, on this work and then the adoption request. Um, so we appreciate <laughs> We appreciate that uh, we have been using this uh, DMM forum to, uh, to discuss those ideas and get consensus, uh, trying to get consensus uh, from the various parties. And this is indeed informational uh, 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 draft, and, but we believe we have got enough consensus uh, th that this is a, a natural evolution for mobile user plan. And I hope that uh, by adopting this, uh, adopting uh, this draft in this working group, it can reflect the consensus in the IETF wireline community that uh, we believe this is the right approach. Eventually, the work will be done in 3GPP, but uh, we do hope that uh, we can uh, document the, our consensus here. So I think a few comments. I think the question is maybe. I think the question is, what is not clear to us, right? What exactly we want to do in DMM working group? I think that's that's the part is not very clear to me. Is it more informational? Or are you suggesting that we do an informational document? And yes, 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 informational. 
Yeah, so it's like uh, it's like a, a evolution, like 4G, 5G, and the 6G, and then we want to get, you know, 6G is like just like 18 months away, and the work is like uh, at least there is some like uh, maybe complement or some work that can be later explored for the 6G uh, um, um, planning. Yeah, right. It's informational and document. Sorry. I have one comment. So, in terms of the adoption, so what does it mean for uh, just socializing? No, 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 no. This is just the uh, socializing is like at the very beginning. So, okay, well, see here, originally we want, we want to collect the information from the IETF or community to get some consensus as the uh, uh, Jeff uh, has already explained. So, okay, well, we acknowledge this is some important work and IETF can collaborate and contribute well as informational uh, RFCs. And then later, you know, uh, when this one start to mature and we're going to bring this one to, uh, to I think this is- You already mentioned that. Um, the work should be done in 3GPP, right? The final, the things like uh, the idea, you know, that this like a loop and cause it going to increase both the, the wireless part and the wireline part. Wireline part will be done here for sure. But the wireless, suppose we do, well, let's say for the 6G, the core network may have a different uh, architecture we do not yet. But because uh, so far, if we have like a, High, pro, uh, high profile uh, use case like a satellite, the infrastructure start to move around. And then in that case, maybe, you know, if you get a too uh, much disaggregated core network and they're going to pose a challenge. But a new thing like if you put like GNOB or UPF, something together actually is going to address better about this type of things. Yeah. Yeah, can, can I ask uh, something summary? So basically, the work, uh, standardization work does need to be done in 3GPP. And we have been and to, during the discussion here, uh, soliciting inputs uh, and support. We believe we have got enough support and consensus uh, on this topic. So by adopting this through this procedure, we're hoping that uh, we can officially say that, yeah, this indeed uh, reflects uh, 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 the IETF uh, point of view that this is the Right thing to do. This is basically becomes the input uh, to to the 3GPP work. So, so it's an input from the IETF community on the 3GPPs where 3GPP should head with respect to their architectural direction. Is, did I summarize it correctly? Um, it, on on one one aspect of their their user playing arch architecture. Okay. Yes. okay. Eric, or area director. Oh uh, yeah, Eric Klein. So based on previous experience uh, information is a lot less likely to cause extreme concern. But um, since the 3GPP liaison is in the room, I wondered if it might be possible to ask Peter to, if he wanted to comment. Peter? Or weigh in. Charles? Charles or Peter? Peter? Oh, oh Peter. Sorry. okay. Sorry, I didn't see. Okay, Peter, you have any view? Put you on the spot. <laughs> Would you care to make some observation as 3GPP liaison at this time? If the 3GPP, if the IETF sent you an informational document of this sort, uh, would that cause any consternation or would it just sort of be accepted as, as input and? Yeah, if you send this as a license statement, as attachment and license statement, then it would work. Or if you go as an in, as an in member, then you can put this as a normal document into the working group, and then it will be discussed as a normal document. If we adopt this document and then send you a liaison statement saying we have adopted this adopted this document, would that be sufficient input? Yeah, let's say in this way, if you send it together with a live statement, then it's officially from IETF and then it's handled differently. Because then it's make sure that it's handled when it's, re when it's received. If you provide a document just from a, just from one uh, individual part member, then this will be handled as a normal document and listed accordingly if it fits to the agenda of the meeting. I'm not sure if this helps. I mean, I suppose it's it's up. I think it, it makes it clear what the choices are. I don't know what it is that we want that folks want to do, though. If it's that's the case to raise with CCPP, which working group is it suitable for that reason in, the, in this agenda? 
SC, a city. I would need to have a look on this document in detail, which working group would be the best one. But I can give you this information. Uh, which way you talking about SA2, right? The architecture team. Yeah, SA2 yeah, yeah. would be the architecture group to highlight the uh, overview on the overall topic. So in this case, if it's just regarding uh, the, high, uh, the overview topic and regarding architecture, then SA2 is the correct one. Okay, we can now uh, discuss the next steps. So, uh, how many people have, or have read this document? Can you raise your hands? Two, three, four, five, six people. So, that's what I see. Yeah, yeah we need uh, some more reviews, I think. So, we can discuss on the next steps. We want some more discussions, right? If you will have to discuss with 3GPP on like, you know, are they okay with this or what it is, right? But if it, as Eric said, if it's more as an input, as an informational document might be okay, right? We'll, we'll discuss, right? we'll discuss, but uh, we need more discussions, right? Six people is not good enough. We need some more reviews, yeah? fair? Okay. Please use the mic. Yes, really, thank you. Uh, do you think I should initiate one email on the LA? LA? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's the starting point. Yeah. Next is uh, BGP signaling for 5G UPF. Jeffrey, yeah. yeah. So um, this is uh, is related to the uh, to the topic we just had. Um, uh, end up idea is to integrate the Geno BCU or access node with the UPF. Um, the purpose of that is to signal uh, to simplify the signaling and optimize the data plane when you have co-located the uh, uh, access node and UPF no uh, devices. Um, can you move to the next slide? Um, um, I'm going to skip some slides here. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to skip this one as well. Um, the slides provide some uh, uh, background, but uh, in, given the, the time limit, I'm, uh, we can just skip the, uh, quite a few slides. Um, Okay, so um, the simplification of the signaling uh, with NAP does need a uh, new work and uh, in 3GPP, and that can only happen in 6G if it's adopted there. Um, but uh, in 5G phase, uh, we can still achieve um, uh, data plane optimization when, uh, when with the co-located uh, in the co-located case. In fact, even using the existing N2 and N4 signaling, um, a vendor can already put all those functions onto the same device, but running separate uh, signaling to the control plane. That that works fine. Um, however, that does mean that uh, the deployment model has to change because previously. Uh, an operator would deploy a central UPF run, run, run a single M4 interface towards the SMF. But well, um, if we want, if you have a lot of uh, distributed UPF and integrate them into the, this NAP, that means that you would have to do the signaling, uh, M4 signaling from the uh, SMF to a lot of distributed UPF or uh, NAP devices here. Um, that may become a burden. Um, now, there is this uh, existing uh, work going on in the DMM working group where we use BGP signaling uh, for, uh, for the map gateway architecture where um, the, the SMF runs a single M4 signaling to a, uh, to a uh, controller and that 
uh, info signaling is then translated into BGP messages, and that is uh, going towards di uh, distributed devices and set up a falling state so that the GDPU uh, termination can happen uh, uh, early on where it's close to the access nodes. That same protocol um, can be used uh, to do NAP, the integrated uh, uh, access node and UPF in 5G without signaling changes. So, so that at least will give us the, um, the data plane op optimization. So that's the uh, idea here. Um, so this slides here is basically a background for the BGP signaling for the map gateway architecture. Um, I'm going to skip the details here. Um, so now to use that for 5G and up, we basically run the, the uh, uh, establish those uh, BGP uh, uh, sessions and, and, and towards this uh, uh, NAP devices instead of uh, towards the map gateways. Um, when, when that happens, the session translated route type one and session translated route type two, those kind of routes will provide enough information for this NAP device to do, uh, to do forwarding for both uplink traffic and downlink traffic and without using the uh, GDP encapsulation, which is the whole purpose uh, uh, of, uh, of this use case when we have the co-located de devices. Um, so um, as I mentioned, I'm not going to, into the details uh, of the signaling, um, but I just want to mention uh, uh, and this uh, work and uh, re uh, refer people to the, to the drafts and, and the slide deck actually. Uh, it does have some background information that I skipped, but the slide deck is there. So basically, a heads up, uh, and, and also appreciate that if you could review and provide us comments here. So. Okay. Thank you. Any questions before that? Was this present in the routing groups, any of the routing groups? Um, no, this is just uh, here because uh, uh, all those routes and, and PGP things are, are just existing uh, uh, signaling that uh, DMM and maybe best working group are already doing. Okay. And this is just the use of the same um, signaling to the uh, NAP devices. So, I think I, I understand the idea, but um, let me just clarify the uh, the time uh, terminology only. Um, a session translated route is not correct. Session transformed route, okay, correct. And Thanks. also the map gateway architecture isn't it's architecture. Architecture is map, map segment routing. That's the uh, clarification. Uh, okay. Yeah, I will change the uh, uh, trans uh, transform uh, uh, translation to transform. Um, the way the reason I use this map gateway architecture is just to because when we say map architecture, there are many architectures. Three GPP has their own map architecture. Here, the particular map architecture. Uh, I mean, referring to here is the one that is documented in the SRV6 map architecture documents. Um, but this is actually SRV6 independent ag agnostic. And initial version of that uh, SRV6 map do doc uh, architecture documents has the concept of a map gateway. I think that map gateway is an important characteristic of the architecture. So I sort of use this uh, map gateway as way one way to to characterize the, uh, the, the, the solution. Um, it, because if I just call it map architecture, it's, it's, it's not clear on exactly what map architecture we're talking about. So we can talk about oh. the name, but I, I, I just- oh, map, is clearly, um, map architecture clearly defined, but um, it's just the, the, uh, the place is the, the difference. And NUP, you can say a map gateway in the past so now the PE is only the terminology in the map architecture. Mm -hmm. But then you can think that map ANA and UP could be a PE of the map architecture. That's my understanding. Yeah, we can, yeah, um, I, I, I get your point, but we can we can follow up on that. Yeah. A few questions online, I think. 
Hanu is online. Hanu or yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. The role of PGP is unclear. It's mentioned in the title of the draft, uh, and only in what uh, one subsection title, but it has it is not described in the draft at all. It, on, based on my reading. Uh, so I, I guess the naming of the draft is, is misleading. This is more about mapping of signaling elements to routing table entries rather than anything to do with PGP signaling. Uh, and if, if we want to keep this term signaling in the title, I would appreciate if, if you could show some kind of call flow or some kind of signaling related topic. Otherwise, this is just mapping of entries to forwarding table. Okay, okay. so I, I, you, if I understand you correctly, I should call out the the, the CEFI or FISFI of PGP signaling in the document title. Yes, um, and in the diagram, so, so where the PGP uh, protocol is applied, it, it so it, it, it's Okay, or I can, I can. This map architecture, but as it's as it's current, it, it's not clear where you use PGP and its signaling capabilities. Okay, okay. I will make it clear. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Sahana. Uh, next, I think Richard Lee. <laughs> Sorry about it. I'm slightly confused. I'd like to have some clarification from you. So here. BGP signaling is used for the transport network operator or for the mobile operator. For example, in America here, so a Comcast network, right? So they carry different mobile traffic up for different mobile operators. So, so what they do, actually they are using, you know, VPN, that kind of thing, a sort of thing there. So, but that's not for the mobile. So, so looks to me, you are trying to use it for the mobile traffic inside the same like a uh, mobile operator. Is that true or not? Because you didn't make it clear to me. So um, there is an existing SRV6 map architecture documents that explains what it does. Um, and this is uh, on top of that uh, using, using that same mechanism. So to go back to going back to uh, your original question, this BGP signaling here using a new CEFI is to signal to the um, NAP de uh, device uh, or the uh, the map PE uh, or map gateway in the original uh, uh, services map architecture document, the the session related information so that uh, those devices know what to do with the opening and downing traffic. Uh, you mentioned uh, traffic. I, I think uh, we have to cut the mic because we are running out of time. So let's take this offline. Yeah. Okay. Next is uh, Sarah Vissan. No. Mia. Yeah. Oh, yes. OK, Mia is going to present. Uh, is Mia in the queue? Mia, are you there? Do you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. I think uh, Sadhguru San is going to share the slides. You want the slides? Oh. One second, uh, yeah, please.
Yeah, Neha, please. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So let me briefly update the draft. So to recap the overview, um, this document discusses the solution approach and its architectural benefits of translating mobile session information into routing information, um, applying segment routing capabilities, and operating it in a routing paradigm. So this draft is meant to be an um, informational document to describe the underlying motivations for the, the DMMS service um, mobile user frameworks. Um, so we have two. Uh, one is uh, RFC, RFC 9433, uh, which is the, the original document to, um, to describe segment routing over IPv6 for the mobile user frame and uh, current working draft, uh, which is the map architecture. Next slide, please. So there are uh, slight updates. Um, Rue uh, from Bryson has joined the the draft as a co-author, and I we we try tried to respond uh, to comments um, from working groups, um, especially um, thanks to Hanu for variable comments. So we clarified that this architecture is not necessarily apply, applicable for all mobile use cases. And this is more for fixed wireless and or certain IoT use cases. And um, we clarified the benefits uh, in a more concrete way. Uh, so this um, architecture is to achieve uh, scaling um, from the order of n squared or to order of n, and also um, to operate in a routing paradigm um, makes the distributing or ubiquitous computing a friendliness. And how we do that is that um, converting the session information to routing information and contain necessary session related information in the SRV6 network programming um, concept and enable to operate it in a routing paradigm. Um, and for the um, main content, it has not been changed, so please also refer to the slides in the previous um, working group meeting. And um, we'd like to ask working group adoption um, as a motivation draft to the um, DMM uh, mobile user architecture, uh, mobile user plane architecture uh, work. And uh, we really appreciate your feedbacks. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. No questions. So, <clears throat> so one, uh, Mia, you're suggesting this to be more an informational track, correct? Yes. Yes, this is to provide the underlying motiv motivations. Okay. So you're asking adoption at this time? Is that? Okay, how many, uh, maybe a couple of questions. How many people have read the document? Please uh, raise your hand. We are going to show, yeah. Raise your hand if you have read the document. I see so far. 
three people have read the document so people have to join the online tool otherwise we wouldn't know or how many can you raise the hand please if you are not on on the tool how many can you raise the hand how many people have read the document okay so it still stays at 3 plus 1 4 5 5 8 6 okay yeah thank you um uh, i think we need some more reviews we can issue an online adoption call but a uh, few more reviews will be useful okay thank you yeah uh, me i think i suggest is there a way can you open up some discussion so that we get some more feedback and we don't have to wait for the next idf i know you guys have been asking for this for a while i think we can uh, some more reviews we can do it now. we can do an online adoption call okay okay thank you thank you uh next is uh mobile okay our next is uh, mobility capability negotiation tng okay one second yes <clears throat> okay uh good afternoon again uh, me and this is another um, draft is uh, called MCN a mobility capability negotiation uh, this is the the work that being uh iterated uh, this is the 11th time so uh this time i added myself uh, is added as co-author so yeah can okay, go to the next one you can use the ppt mode Yeah. Uh here well here it's just like uh, what has been done up to uh 116 Yokohama this uh Yokohama is like the 10th iteration so basically until then uh collect the the previous comments feedback discussions uh from ITF experts and then it talk about more so summarize into like uh, for the MCN mobility capability negotiation on IPv6 like uh, uh, uh MIP v6 or proxy uh MIP uh the sixth part and also that one talk about mcn uh, with 5g mobility pattern and uh, and at the end summarize some uh, prioritized uh, considerations for the mcn uh, protocol and uh, negotiation protocols how to uh, select which one um, uh, based on a priority list so can go for so the next uh, three slide here just like the pre previous work and you uh, 116 this is for that v6 categorization here i uh, just put here for uh, completeness you yeah, go next and yeah, next is still the previous work just to summarize like uh, uh, how it's going uh, to be applied with like a 5g mobile pattern uh, can go next one or just a quick uh, Uh, so through this is the priority list uh, that being uh, summarized based all the work until the iteration 10s so cause the yeah can you go to the next one so for the last one it's just like for last three slides just the work now being uh, done until um, the 10th iteration oh, no yeah the next the previous one sorry no 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 go up yeah 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 here well oh. no, the next one sorry No, no, the next one. Yeah, yeah, this one. So this is the things I mentioned here, like from last time until uh, this uh, 117. Uh, myself I added as a co-author, and then based on all the uh, investigation discussion, and this time we significant, significantly restructured the uh, the draft. Uh, based on feedback comment discussion and previous work and uh, we uh, investigate and analyze and then this time give a dichotomy of uh, uh, mcn protocols and then after that applied mcn to mobile ipv6 
uh, domain and also apply to the uh, 3GPP 5GS. It's like uh, we, based on work, we summarize a uh, dichotomy, it's like a classification of the MCM protocols, and then we apply our classification uh, method into the mobile IPv6 and the mobile wireless uh, uh, on 5GS. So the, the right part is the structure uh, of the, the draft. Okay, can you go to the next? Yeah, here, before I go further, I just gave uh, two, uh, you know, two terminologies, uh, just the two concepts. And one is the wireline devices, one is the wireless devices. And then regarding the mobility capabilities for wireline devices, it's more uh, mainly related on uh, mainly on IP related like uh, address allocation, provisioning, traffic steer, traffic switching, real, uh, redirection, optimization. But the, for the wireless devices, the mobility capabilities will, um, con uh, will consist of both the mobile IP related, that's the one I described above, and also wireless specific categories, like the radio one on the, like the mobile management, like a session management. Uh, those some te uh, terminologies I, I got from the 5GS. Yeah. So yeah, just the key. Yes. So based on, as I mentioned here, this time we significantly restruct the ID. So that work is the based on analysis of various mobile IP and uh, 5GS scenarios. And then, you know, we summarize the protocols uh, for cap capability management and the negotiation into, sorry, next slide, uh, into uh, two uh, categories. One is called the host initiated. The other one is the network based. So the, the main difference is for host initiated, it's like during the uh, I'm saying the negotiation part, it requires uh, involvement or active involvement of the mobile and the devices. Well, for network based, the <clears throat> the, uh, the, it does not uh, require the active in involvement about mobile uh, end devices. So that is the major things we, you know, based on all the analysis from the mobile IP and also IPv6 and the mobile wireless. So we, we give this a dichotomy of the MCN protocols. Yes. And then after that, we, um, we apply this one uh, on the mobile IPv6. There are quite a few RFCs, protocols, and then on uh, uh, MIPV6 um, and the proxy MIPV6. So MIPV6 is basically the host based, and the uh, P, a proxy MIPV6 is a network based. So I'm not going to cover details. All those things have been discussed before and also in the draft. Yeah, can you go further? Yeah, one, one, yes. Here, the same thing uh, for the uh, um, dichotomy uh, we, we come up and I'm seeing applied in the, uh, the 5GS general case. And then as I mentioned for wireless uh, devices, it, uh, it consists of both the wireless specific MCN and also the IP uh, related. So uh, for the wireless specific, it is like, uh, uh, it's more like the integration of host initiated and the network based since the, the UE will get involved by providing its capability to the network and the network will negotiate based on the system setting. So this is like integration uh, between the whole uh, integration of the host and the network, most both. So, so one question here, where does uh, MP quick, a host capable of MP quick or MPTCP fit into this uh, overall scheme with respect to capability indication? Oh, uh, MP, uh, quick part, MP, those times it's going to have the, the session based and also the IP based. So the session is that uh, belong to the uh, uh, 5G SMCN and the IP uh, address is belong to the, uh, the UE IP address negotiation and management on the second bullet. So it's going to include both. So therefore wireless device is going to have both. Yeah, that's a good question here. So, but for the, um, yeah, this is uh, for the 5G, uh, the, the roaming, uh, the case, cause uh, in the, the roaming when the, uh, and the device uh, roamed to another domain uh, called the visited network or VP, uh, VPLMN. So uh, on, on that case, so for the, there are two uh, roaming cases. One is the home routed, one is the local breakout. For the home routed, it has uh, both the uh, network-based mode and the host-initiated mode. And then we put, uh, I'm not going to read the, the details, but the things like uh, for the negotiation is going to have both, uh, both things, especially for the host. Well, for the network, it's more like the network going to uh, provide address and parameter uh, things. Well, for the host-initiated, the UE, where uh, the UE subscriber record will be retrieved. 
for the uh, negotiation part. And then in this case, um, uh, for the from home routed case, the H H means home UPF is more like a home agent in the mobile in the mobile IP domain. And for local breakout is the uh, uh, the bottom part is. Uh, is that there's no host initiated because the, the no retrieval of the host based uh, information. Yeah. And then uh, in this, sorry, can you go? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, in the uh, local uh, breakout case, it's like uh, VUPF, it's more like uh, a mobile access gateway in mo mobile IP uh, domain. So, yeah. So, so far, yeah, here the summary is like uh, this time we significantly, based on the work, well, based on feedback, comment, discussions, this time significantly restructured. And we uh, provide a, a dichotomy of the MCN since mobility management and the capability negotiating protocols. And then we apply it uh, to the mobile IP domain and the 3GPP 5GS, one in the general scenarios, uh, one is the roaming scenarios. And then, yeah, one, just one slide. Click, yeah. So we uh, do. Oh no, not yet. Okay. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Here is like uh, uh, we uh, analyze what has been uh, adopted uh, in the DMM working group. It's more revolving around the mobile user plan. So yeah, it's actually is uh, we all understand it. It bears the natural extensibility because like the mobile. Uh, user plan, like you look at N3 interface, N9 interface, N6 interface. So from the mobile uh, wireless to, uh, um, from the wireless to wireline, it's very, uh, it's, a uh, it's very natural. But uh, for these things, we are looking at the management plan. So it's like uh, it different, um, uh, the different things, but there's a way of knowledge is more challenge than because it's not so natural, but uh, still, uh, I think uh, based on uh, other work, uh, we have uh, done some significant uh, analysis and uh, we have put something good there. So we, this time it's the 11th iteration, so we want to for adoption. Yeah. Okay, uh, one quick question, yeah, comment, fine. right? I think, see, we don't have, we have to recognize that we don't have any client mobile API adoption. So the question is, generally as a capability indication, there may be value, or, you know, host is like in you know, a particular MPTCP capable, MP quick capable, when we bring in CMIP and all of that, you know, we lost that battle, right? We have to recognize that, right? So the question is, we do this group does have the charter for you know protocol maintenance, right? But because their implementations, even my own company, Cisco, we have many implementations of the PMIP and other things, right? We have deployments, right? So as a maintenance is okay, but fundamentally, if you bring in some new thing, oh, we have to show. Oh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's like a, we won't get this like informational. It's not like a new thing. We, we analyze what has what have been achieved. Yeah, in the mobile IPv6 and in the 5G, mm -hmm. we are not trying to uh, invent or uh, push in some new technologies. It's just based on the current analysis, and we give a classification about why it host initiate, why is a network based. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Any, any feedback on this document or how many people have familiar with this work or at the document? Yeah, I put this one on the alias uh, and okay. then and then talk to some people. Okay, uh, we, yeah, need, so, we need, yeah. uh, uh, I think, zero feedback. We need some. Yeah, questions. yeah. I but I think yeah. Yeah, my suggestion is, I think overall capability indication, they have a value in IP terms. But let's look at the current context. Let's, let's not be hung up with the legacy stuff. I think that would be my feedback. And if you can generalize it and make it more useful in the current context, it will be very good. I think that would be my recommendation. Okay, sure. Thank you. Yeah, actually, there are one more slide, which is like okay. that. Yeah. Right. Nothing, but just like that. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Next is again, Satu Sand. Which one is? Checksum? Checksum, yes. Who is the presenter? Ah, Tetsuya San. Okay, impact analysis from IPv6 GTPU checksum calculation. It's all yours. Yeah, uh, this is a new draft uh, about the impact analysis from the IPv6 GTPU checksum calculations.
Yeah, here is the background. So uh, 3GP we allow to use a UDP checksum uh, for IPv6 GTP from DD16. So uh, of course, so UDP checksum there uh, is also allowed uh, only when the receiver node can accept it. So however, uh, we can see a, a lot of nodes in the uh, actual field uh, still requiring the uh, checksum calculations. As a result, uh, uh, sender node uh, need to spend the, uh, a lot of CPU power uh, to calculate the uh, UDP checksum. So uh, we consider this might cause the uh, non-trivial impact on the performance, uh, let's say, uh, latency. So uh, this uh, uh, analysis, the impact on the network performance uh, when UDP checksum is calculated uh, for the IPv6 GTPU packet. Yeah, uh, here is the uh, uh, brief uh, test setup. So we are using a BPP uh, to calculate the uh, uh, degrade on the latency. So in order to make this simplify, uh, we are using uh, only one TXRXQ uh, uh, to uh, measure the performance, network impact. So uh, uh, we are using a VPP as a sample. So uh, uh, VPP receiving the uh, multiple packet at the same time, and also uh, process the uh, multiple packet in parallel. Uh, as a result, uh, VPP sent out the uh, uh, multiple packet at, uh, at one shot. So at that time, so first packet is coming to the VPP at the T0, and then this packet is sent out to the T1 uh, uh, along with the uh, other packet. At that time, as a uh, 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 default latency is t uh, uh, T1 minus T0. So based on this, uh, we are measuring uh, what's the difference uh, when enabling the UDP checksum. Yeah. So first case is a, a small amount of the packet. So uh, just injecting the 100 PPS. So at that time, so uh, left side is uh, no checksum calculation. So middle side is a hardware offload. Uh, right side is a software checksum calculation. At that time, we cannot see uh, any difference here. Yeah. Also, we are injecting the, a huge amount of the packet. At that time, so uh, 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 latency degrade is very significant. So uh, in case of the uh, no checksum and hardware offload, we cannot see a huge difference. However, uh, even those using a hardware offload, uh, we can see uh, some uh, uh, impact on the uh, latency side. However, in case of the software side, so we can see a huge degrade here, and also we can see a packet loss here. Yeah. So here is the analysis. So if the uh, VPP batching time, so enough greater the time uh, which is required to process the packet by VPP, in this case, uh, there are uh, many remaining CPU resources, CPU spaces. In this case, so uh, uh, we can uh, complete the two DB checksum calculation within the uh, uh, remaining spaces. For this, so we cannot see uh, any degrade here. However, so uh, if having the uh, uh, tons of packet, uh, uh, in this case, so uh, VPP consuming the uh, uh, more CPU time to process the old packet. As a result, so uh, 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 there is no uh, enough space to complete the uh, checksum calculation. For this, we can see a huge degrade, uh, uh, especially uh, when using a software checksum calculation. So uh, uh, degrade is very huge. Yeah, here is the conclusion. So uh, uh, based on the, uh, our analysis, so uh, UDP checksum calculation uh, can cause a uh, uh, huge uh, degrade on the latency uh, when receiving the lot of packet. So also, uh, 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 yeah, today, so uh, we can see uh, many nodes cannot accept the UDP checksum there. So as a result, so uh, 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 sender node, or like a software router, uh, need to consume the uh, more CPU slots uh, when sending the uh, packet in order to calculate the UDP checksum. So also, uh, third point, so even though we are using a hardware offload, 
uh, still uh, we can see uh, uh, some impact on their performance. But however, it depends on the uh, NIC performance itself. So uh, finally, so uh, we are thinking uh, it is very ideal to use the UDP checksum cell as default. So when using a UDP as a tunnel encapsulation, uh, uh, like a GTPU, and also uh, we are strongly thinking it is highly recommended to use the uh, UDP checksum cell as default. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, interesting contribution. Any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, yeah, please go. Uh, Eric Klein, sorry, I haven't had a chance to read the document, but um, if you get a chance, uh, RFC uh, 6936 and 6935, uh, you, might, you might have mentioned them already, but if not, they're, they're worth the read because they're IPv6 applicability statements for UDB checksums for applications and for tunnels. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, ITF allowed to use the UDP checksums though, but just still, in case of just 3 gpp so many uh, uh, nodes is still requiring the uh, uh, UDP checksum for the IPv6 GTP. So this is more about telling yeah. 3 gpp to... Yeah, it's a, it's a today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what's the recommendation? Finally, you want to put it as zero. I mean, yeah. UDP sum. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Hi, Leo Fujita from Top Bank here. Um, we've seen it in the field. We've seen um, G packets at the Gino D uh, being discarded also. So um, we shared a concern about um, having the um, zero checksum not being um, seen. So we are we also agree about um, RFC 6935 and 6936 being strongly applied to mm -hmm. all the genome fees. So that's my comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. Next is Suresh. Uh, sorry, TNG. Uh, yes, yeah. I have a comments regarding the first part. It's like receiving the degrade when receiving a lot of packets. So are you implying the con congestion will happen on the N3 part? Or uh, is uh, what is uh, receiving a lot of packets? Uh, receiving from the... Uh, 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 we are simulating the access side, so we are receiving the IP packet and then encapsulating it into the GTPU packet. Yeah, the things like the cost for the normally for the uh, transport on N3, and, yeah, the and also, bandwidth is sufficiently yeah. large enough. And also different yeah. side, so especially from the, uh, we are receiving the IP packet from the DR, and then UPF is encapsulating it into the GTPU. Yeah, the understand part. I saw, you know, I try to get the clarified here is like a cost uh, for the N3 pipe there. Normally, the bandwidth is sufficiently large, so you're not going to get congestion. So I'm not sure, you know, receiving a lot no. of means like you're going to get a congestion and then cause the problem, or it's, uh, as long as you receive some packet, it's going to cause the problem. So just to try to so get it clarified. We, yeah, we, we don't talk about the congestion size. So we are just focusing on the single node performance. So uh, that's uh, like a software route is processing the packet. At that time, we are comparing the uh, uh, required time without calculating a UDP checksum, with calculating a UDP checksum. So uh, it can make the, uh, some impact on the uh, packet holding. Hey, uh, Jeffrey yeah. from Juniper. Jeffrey, yeah. um, if calculating UDP checksum causes problem, um, especially on software routers, that is a, actually a good reason to do uh, an app when you do have co-located uh, uh, access node and UPF because you get rid of the uh, GTPU tunnel entirely when you have that uh, situation. Thanks. Okay, thanks for the comment. Yeah, Suresh. Yeah, Suresh Krishnan. So like, I, I totally understand your problem. I, I know this exists, right? Like, but it's not clear to me, like, you know, following up on what Eric said. So we did the zero checksum for UDP specifically for tunnels, right? So um, I'm not sure what is the right action for us, right? Because we already published something which tells people it's okay to not do it. So I think the remaining action is in 3GPP. And I would suggest probably the best thing to do is like send a liaison statement saying, hey, like, you know, um, like, you know, this is allowed to do it. 
But if somebody wants to do it, we cannot stop it. Because if you look at the RFCs that like Eric cited, they don't make it mandatory to make it zero. <laughs> it's allowed to have zero, right? Because that's what we've done. So if people still insist, if your vendors, for example, right, insist that, that they have to do it, then there's not much we can do. So, and also another thing I noticed is like you were citing the release 17 version of the 23501. It, it, does it still exist? It's, it's keeping on going forward? Let me follow up. So okay, cool. In CPP, okay. um, CPP uh, spec, especially GTP, you allow UDP checksum zero on, uh, from uh, this 16 onward. Okay. But um, it's the text is a um, little bit um, conservative to recommend UDP checksum zero. I don't know the reason, but uh, I don't know that's the reason why not. Many of the the, the uh, CPP. Uh, equipment uh, remained to keep the UDP checksum. Okay, sounds good. I, I, I really think like a liaison statement would be a good idea to send one. Like, uh, I think it's like fairly straightforward. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be any disagreement that sending this is like right, useful. Right. No, I think this is good, useful work. Your analysis is extremely useful. I think the action is there. I think on that side, I think um, the question is, are there any some backward compatibility issues? I think uh, we need something. If you want to, you know, put some allies and LS, we can absolutely issue that. That's one path. Or, yeah, yeah. we can discuss. Yeah, but this is good work. Thanks for bringing yeah. this up. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Marco. Marco Levish on now. Yeah, this is a brief report about <clears throat> mobile traffic steering. Next slide, please. So br brief background. Um, yeah, we, we brought the topic to um, DMM at last ITF 116 and uh, got uh, good feedback about this. So we just want to see if there was interest and value and energy to look at more advanced mobility scenarios. Um, and if there is some room for documentation or even standardization to do in the ITF without interfering with other SEOs and that. So um, in between or during ITF 6, 116 and uh, in between uh, the two ITFs until now, we had good uh, discussion <laughs> on the mailing list and also offline. And um, we said, let's give the topic a little bit more room. And we organized a site meeting during this week, last Monday. And we had a small room, but the room was pretty crowded. So that was a good sign. And we got feedback from people who saw that the first time, which helped us a lot in, let's say, assessing some of the problems that we stated a little, a little bit different viewpoint. So that, that was good. Um, that was the agenda that we had. We had three short and crisp presentations. There was one plan from David, but he couldn't make it because of a travel in Europe. So Jeffrey and, and Tanji made some, some presentation here, which we have briefly summarized. Let's not dig into the discussion of, of these slides. I think uh, we, we can do that offline. This is just a report about the lessons learned from, from that kind of session. Next one, please. Um, again, the technical background as we presented at last IEDF. So um, there is uh, more and more features also enabled in 3GPP looking at the 5G system. And um, today, <clears throat> different session and service continuity modes in 3GPP allow a mid-session relocation of a mobility anchor, which is denoted the UPF in, in, in 3GPP. So, um, However, the mobility management system per 3 GPP does not uh, look at the full end-to-end -end, uh, segments, <clears throat> but mainly between the UE and the mobility anchor, which is the UPF. So if we want to have service continuity, we need to see on this remaining path, the N6 reference point, how to treat the traffic there and how can we steer the traffic in case such relocation and change in the mobility domain happens. Um, 
So the objective here is session service continuity after mobility anchor relocation. Next slide, please. I'll be very brief here. So. Um, this is a general formulation of the problem. And um, so if we see the very small mobility domain, because that's nothing we want to interfere, we take the features that um, the mobility system will bring. And in case there is a relocation of the mobility anchor uh, mid session, then in the PU routing domain from the mobility anchor up to the um, service domain, uh, we need to see how we can steer the traffic. Um, whether the UE keeps its IP address or changes IP address, in particular, if we have IP address continuity, we may move a routable IP address of the UE into a non-routable IP address. Nevertheless, um, the system needs to be notified that that change happened and we need to adjust the routing uh, in, in this routing domain up to the service uh, to continue the session. And here we draw the mobility control plane, which may interwork with the transport control plane. We will learn that's not always the case. So that's something we need to figure out a little bit more and differentiate different cases. Uh, but in the next slide, we'll show what, what we plan to do here. Next one. Um, okay, so the discussion point per, per last IETF was so first of all, is there interest? Is there value in doing, doing these things? And uh, according to the feedback and discussion we had, um, we, we understand there is interest and value in doing that, uh, but not coming with the specification next week, but looking more at the problem and looking at space uh, where we may need documentation because there may be technology already doing that, or maybe we find some gaps that are worthwhile standardizing, right? So that's a, a procedure we want to enter. And um, so a couple of reference points where we could do documentation or closer investigation. For example, between the two control planes, we could see which semantic could apply here um, to enforce that kind of end-to-end -end traffic steering in the view of session continuity. Um, different control planes in the transport network may apply here too. Um, also, uh, on the data plane, different protocols may be used. We could make use of encapsulation, of segment routing, anything may, may apply here. So we could look at different options here, uh, but later we see we found something else that could be done in the view of data plane optimization. Next slide, please. Um, during the ITF last uh, March, and in between various aspects have been addressed going even beyond the traffic steering aspect. So people had interest in even looking at beyond 5G kind of scenarios here, uh, though we wanted to, to look at the traffic steering uh, in the first place, but uh, people brought up non-terrestrial networks, metaverse kind of end-to-end -end, uh, QoS. So that's all of interest, but maybe we need to scope a little bit the work in the first place here. Um, also, mid-session, no tent over, which is not only the UE, but it may be the mobility anchor, as we see, but maybe also um, the data network. So if we talk about edge computing, so mid-session, maybe the data network decides that the UE should continue its service from another edge, right? And in that case, the mobility domain need to follow by assigning a new UPF that's close to the new data network. So all these scenarios, something we could look at. UE to UE communication is also particular. So each UE has its mobility anchor. So how to treat the traffic in a good way in case one UE's mobility anchor gets changed. Right? The same problem, but not between a hub router, but between two UEs and their mobility anchors. So different scenarios is what we looked at. And here, of course, we need to see, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we need to see which technology other groups, standard groups or inside the IETF, uh, maybe there is technology that can be beneficial here. Next one. Okay, so briefly from, from Jeffrey, we got a presentation about the general architecture problem space with the hub PE and two um, user plane functions, which are the mobility anchors which get relocated mid-session. And uh, so here, um, he looked at 
in particular a problem which may appear if you switch the path. That happens also in a regular handover in the mobile network. So packets may get reordered. And uh, so here the idea was to do something in the view of data plane optimization by making use of end markers. Uh, so that's a technology that has been inherited from free TPP and brought up to the N6 reference point. So I think there will be more discussion on that, but um, that's a good contribution. Ne next one. And from Tanji, we, we got a, a bit of a summary of related aspects, in particular in the view of free GPP and SA2. Um, so where are the shortcomings today in treating end-to-end -end traffic in a 5G system? Um, then how to leverage and make use of the functions that come from 3GPP domain, like the more generic application function, which could be used in a transport network control plane, the, the application function, or, um, or other features. Um, traffic steering is also looked at in a recently established working group in the ITF, the CATS group, uh, computing aware traffic steering. So it's um, related, but does not look at the same objectives here. But it's good to see that there are, if there are synergies, or at least if we don't do double work uh, with similar objectives here. And also edge computing has been brought in, into that. So that was a good contribution also. Um, next one. All right, uh, two slides before we come to the actual summary. So we learned that um, not always the problem applies to, to, to any kind of architecture. So we had Joel in the session that was a good comment that if the data networks in a different uh, autonomous system, maybe it does not bother with a switch of the mobility anchor here. So end to end is not always applicable here but one end could be the hub router here of the domain where the mobility system applies to. So uh, nevertheless, switching on, on that path is something required, but using the term end-to-end -end does not always mean it's really end from the UE to the actual data service, dependent on the deployment in which uh, ASSA they apply. Um, from all these reference points and function that we looked at, so two of them seem to be more promising in that we could look at them in, in more detail and have some initial documentation. So one is in case we have an architecture which applies a transport controller, um, we could look at the semantics that apply in between the transport controller and the mobility control plane. That gives a lot of flexibility to not only initiate such a mobility anchor relocation uh, in the mobility domain and follow in the transport network. But if the transport network or data network decides to change the data network, we could request a change in the mobility anchor assignment in the 3GPP domain. So that kind of semantic could be very generic in the view of control messages, semantics, uh, information models that could be useful also for other mobility uh, standards to follow and see how to interwork with these approaches. The other one is the big arrow here, which applies to any kind of transport in the uh, routing domain. And in particular, the end marker concept to tackle a little bit the problem of the reordering of data plane packets during such a path switch. That's something we also plan to look at. Next one. Um, as we also learned, there is not always an architecture and that uh, that, that relies on a transport network controller. So as discussed beforehand, there may be um, mobility anchors which entirely rely on a routing plane. So BGP route updates could be used to inform a hub router about a change in the UE's mobility anchor. So that's also pretty common here, but we don't have a controller that can talk to the mobility control plane here. So this is a little bit in a kind of limitation because we cannot enforce a change in the mobility domain by talking to the mobility control plane. But the basic principle of if the mobility domain decides to relocate a mobility anchor of a UE, um, the transport network can follow. That, that principle works. The same optimization may be useful here, applying end marker scheme uh, to tackle the reordering problem of data plane packets may be useful here. So next slide, please. And that's the last one. 
it's it's not complete, but um, that's what we mainly concluded. And um, so we learned our lesson that end-to-end -end principle does not apply to any kind of deployment and architecture. But we need a little bit, be, be a little bit careful here in how we formulate this, but um, we identified some potential work, which we don't want to start with a standardization document, but with documentation, because we see to foster discussion, it's better for people to have something to read instead of you start always to explain the problem statement. So having a very broad document, not too long, 10, 15 pages, where we exactly describe what, what I just explained and maybe going a little bit further, that for sure helps to get a larger community and see if there is value in doing some standards work. So as said, potential work could be on um, the semantics between the different controllers, mobility control plane, transport control plane, uh, and also on the data plane in the view of optimizations and uh, packet reordering problem and how to tackle that. Starting point, we said, uh, let's start with a document to describe all these things in a clear way to get feedback and for some more discussion and see if additional documents could be, could be worked upon. Thank um, you. That's it. Thank you, Marco. There's Linda. Great question. Thank you very much for the presentation. So my first question is, uh, when you steer the UE traffic, what are the basis? What are the things you based on to steer the UE traffic? In the N6 reference point? or in No, the no, no. Domain? Whatever proposal you have here, what are the basis? Are you based on processing time or network delay or service delay? What are the things? Well, if the data network is an edge computing domain uh -huh. and the mobility domain, because of mobility of the UE, for example, decides to relocate the UPF, mm -hmm. then you may need to steer from this edge computing domain to a new UPF. Right? That does not happen automatically. Okay. So you may need to enforce host routes to make the packets reaching the new UPF instead of being forwarded to the previous one. Also, you, 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 you intend to influence the mobile network to choose a different UPF than they originally planned? Like, for example, the mobile network choose UPF. They anchor to UPF1, right, for yes. example. And you want to influence that decision to anchor to a different UPF? Is that, that was the intent? advanced scenarios. So first we started to look at a reactive approach. So if the mobility domain decides to relocate and assign a new UPF to an existing session of a UE, mm -hmm. the transport network needs to follow. Right, right. Okay. But if we have interworking between the two control planes and some decision in the transport network or data network happens to continue a session by using a new data network, that could be told to the mobility domain, I see. which then re, well results in a new UPF being assigned. Okay, so that the second part may be an uphill battle in 3GPP. I would as, uh, anticipate <sighs> very hard battle. Yeah. But for the first part, if the um, the mobile network 5G core already choose a UPF, and here we want to steer into a different oh, edge data center. Okay. No, that, that's a that, reactive part. Yeah, we have a, a document in uh, IDR already uh, using okay. BGP to propagate those information to influence the ingress node, which is connect to the UPF yes. to choose the um, edge data center. Oh, that's that's called the 5G edge um, metadata. So there's a new pass attribute created to pass the information, just let you know. Can it's very good if there are already yeah. existing documents. So that, that was the second option, right? Without a transport network controller, but making use of distributed routing plane to, to propagate the new routes towards the new UPF by means of, of routing, right? Yeah. yeah okay. okay. That's a good reference. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think there was one more question. Uh, very quick question, Richard, because we are, okay. Uh, before that, for the end marker, do we fundamentally need a new architecture? Do you envision buffering on the routers, uh, Marco, or is it still uh, buffering on the radius is sufficient? Well, these details need to be worked out. It's just one enabler that could help to tackle. I think it should not apply in any case, but maybe in a selected case. Mm -hmm. But maybe Jeffrey has more, more comments here. So, really quick one. Sure. So, um, 
it looks that like, uh, you are not considering truck stealing between the base station to the uh, MA, but for the N3 there, normally that's a network there. So it's fairly complicated. And uh, so is there any reason you are not considering that part? You only considering like after MA, you know, looks like that. Uh, sorry, can you repeat after? So uh, after that mobile anchor, right? So yeah, exactly. you, you have a, like a transport yeah, that, controller that, that's there. Because, but the, yeah. before that, from the base station to the mobile anchor, here it's also a network. Usually it's, it's also a transport network. Yeah, but we assume you that are not will be tackled by the mobility management system. And we don't want to interfere with 3GPP how to do that, yeah. right? 3GPP only specifies mm. an interface. But how are you going to implement it or deploy it? Yeah. It's not inside the scope of okay. 3GPP. Yeah. It was intention to really scope the work um, from to the remaining segment on N6 reference point between the mobility anchor and the data network, because that's not looked at in 3GPP particular. Um, of course, probably not all features to support such a relocation scenario are there, even in 3GPP. That, that's correct, but that could be additional work then that could be contributed to 3GPP. Just one comment sure. to deal with UEP relocation. The default solution is using SSG mode three. Yes. Yes. This is the mode that's being supported, but maybe not all the aspects of how to trigger that, how to do all the um, updates in the three GPP domain, according to the previous speaker's comment, are already um, done and, and ready to deploy. That, that that's a different thing that we could look at, right? But we want to really scope that into the scope of ITF and to complement 3GP and not to interfere. Okay. Thank you, Marco. I think you. we have one more last presentation. Uh, PNG. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, first, thank you, uh, the, the chairs, to accommodate this one, because uh, we did not uh, uh, originally make the cutoff deadline, and then later we submit after the portal uh, reopened over the past uh, Sunday. So this one originally uh, was targeting for the TSVWG, and then because, uh, you know, um, we, at the end, we propose some uh, possible uh, solutions that are going to use the UDP option. That's why originally we, we put there. So the, the motivation part is just uh, based on the 3GPP SA2 XRM uh, projects and then uh, should make the no need to read all the things just uh, to uh, make this simple. It's like uh, this XRM service is requiring for some high data rate and a low latency. So that one has to be uh, achieved through all kinds of uh, technologies. And then this one is uh, like a, like the thing in like the ITF side has been uh, using like LFS with the ECN, uh, AQM, uh, with uh, RTP, QS handling, all kind of things. So you just uh, uh, memorize one thing is XRM is uh, from the 3GPP and require uh, some high data rate and low latency. So okay, can you go next one? So cost uh, of that things, and then uh, uh, two months back, there was uh, one um, uh, SST standard uh, slice types that's been standardized uh, uh, in uh, SA2 uh, two months back in Berlin. And this is uh, the sixth uh, SST called uh, HDLLC. Uh, although this one can be used to handle XRM service, but uh, this is uh, more general, like uh, HDLLC. So anything that requires this type of things. So this just memorize XRM need it and then HDLC can be used to handle it. But still there's uh, some, uh, although the XRM uh, work has been done to some, uh, to certain point, well, I think 98%, there are two more, uh, 2% uh, to be handled. But still there's one uh, big challenge is like uh, uh, normally the XRM streams will be encrypted. So that means like uh, there's a lot of important information that need, be, uh, that need to be attracted uh, when for the downstream uh, 
when downstream streams or packet datagrams reach the UPF from the uh, the right hand side. If uh, look at the the picture here, it's like IP uh, the DNN the uh, toward the uh, the left to the UPF is the the uh, downlink side. So when that one reach the the UPF, if that one uh, the datagram is encrypted, so that means the all the important information that need. Uh, to differentiate uh, among different uh, uh, packet uh, datagrams may not be able uh, to be available uh, for UPF to do the uh, differentiation because those information will be used uh, on the N3 and also used uh, for the genome B uh, to do the resource optimization. So this is a challenge for encrypted. Okay, uh, can you uh, go to the next one? So in order to do that things, and then here well, well, I'm thinking, you know, try to, oh, this is just uh, thinking a lot since uh, uh, these are possible schemes from ITF uh, that going to be uh, going to uh, help uh, uh, 3GPP for uh, XRM uh, like HDLIC uh, service. So when they're using the 6 bit DS field, but the things like I uh, give the Pros and the cons. The cons part is that the 64 combinations might not be enough. The, the second thing is like uh, the hierarchical, uh, the lack of ha uh, hierarchy uh, on the DSDP itself is uh, is not a very uh, sufficient. It's not sufficient. Okay. So yeah, next. Yes. So actually, well, because of that, I'm thinking you know use the the UDP option. I discussed with the partners from the 3GPP side. Discussed with my uh, co-author, my colleagues uh, who are experts uh, on the uh, 3GPP. So basically, here is like uh, if we use the UDP option, uh, here is uh, the it's a better alternative. It can do the encryption handling uh, to provide more granular um, capabilities and also extensibility. So the thing here, well, based on the UDP option draft, and then it has defined all kind of things that can be used uh, to handle these things. And then we can, you know, uh, basically, well, in my in our mind is to get one single uh, uh, code out of the two, uh, 256 option UDP option uh, values, and then that one assigned for the three GPP network slides. And then under that, we define a substructure. Uh, to uh, for all the concrete as the standard uh, slice types. One is um, is the HDLLC SST that can be used to handle the uh, high data rate, low latency, and mm -hmm. uh, the media power. But the thing is, like uh, I think uh, there is the one big challenge regarding the UDP is like it has to be end to end. Right? It's like uh, in cap at the UDP source and the decap at UDP destination. So. Here is like uh, you are going to do something on the UPF, so it's my break the IP uh, the layer demarcation. No. Can you go up? Can you go? go yeah, up? we have we have like two minutes, but yes. I... Yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah. be down soon. Right. Yeah, the things like oh, so the argument here is like the five GS is more like a composite system. It has a UE inside and also has the UPF, so it's like a black box or just a join in the IP domain. So that means when not the datagram reach the, the 5GS and then it's up to 5GS to do all the work. It has full control of the, the system, has the UE, has the UPF. So in that case, we can, it's on the broad sense, it's just like end to end. So that is uh, the argument. And also from yesterday's uh, uh, TSVWG group, and there is the, uh, uh, the list of five tenants. One basic is UDP option. Uh, a framework. So basically, like you define that one as a framework. Here we define the use SST uh, matching, the slice matching as a framework. And then on, after that, we define the sub uh, structures for this type of things. Actually, I discussed with uh, Gory about these things, and Gory said, "Okay, yeah, you you try to get the like, blog, and then get the the parent structure and the sub structures. So this is the thing, and uh, you know, some uh, yeah, the work. So that's that, that's it. This is still the version uh, zero zero. Okay. So thank you." Uh, we don't have, we have literally one minute. Any quick question, we can take it. Okay, nobody's in the queue. Yeah, this is Thank very you. interesting work. Remember, yeah. yesterday during the TSVWG, there are a lot of people showing interest. Yeah, significant yeah. people, like 30, I think. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for attending the meeting. We now close this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you in Prague. See you, oh, yeah, see you in Prague. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know. Without you, I can't survive. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not even joking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>